Good afternoon, and welcome to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Ann Billisbach, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you, whether you're here in person or watching this on uh, cable uh, channel 5 on, on Lincoln Public Access Television. Um, the Brown Bag Lecture Series is held every third Thursday of the month here at the Museum of Nebraska History, and we invite you to uh, take advantage of, of some of the wonderful programs that we offer. Uh, for a detailed schedule of the programs, you can go to our website at www.nebraskahistory.org and find out a little bit more about what is available in, in uh, upcoming months. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I also want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation. Um, they fund the filming of these lectures, which allows us to broadcast them on public access uh, television and to tape them so that we can uh, loan them out to people who are interested in the subjects that we're, we're talking about. And so we're very grateful for their support. Um, today's speaker is Paul Eisloffel, who is curator of audiovisual materials in the Library Archives Division of the Nebraska State Historical Society. Um, Paul was one of the people who helped develop the concept of Weird Nebraska, the exhibit. And uh, uh, if, if you know Paul, you know he is interested in all things weird, I think. Um, his, the title of his uh, talk today is Real Weird, as you can see on the screen, R-E-E-L, Weird, Nebraska Oddities and Idiosyncrasies in Moving Images. So please join me in welcoming Paul Eisoffel. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, this is a tie-in to our Weird Nebraska exhibit, which for a while now. In fact, it's uh, this. I guess you could call this the swan song for the exhibit because it's uh, it's going to be coming down uh, within about a month, sometime in uh, February 2007. So if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to do so. There are some moving images actually in the exhibit, but I'll be showing you some today that aren't. Um, when we were planning the exhibit, the whole weird Nebraska thing, we didn't quite know what to do with the term weird. Uh, unusual, bizarre, outlandish, you know, we didn't want to put anybody off, we wouldn't, didn't want to insult anybody, uh, but it all turned out to be all of those things and more. But when I chose the film clips to share today, um, I wasn't sure to make of this weirdness uh, thing either. So I just kind of preferred to call it, uh, you don't see that every day, and I think you'll you'll see what I mean when I show you some of these clips. So herewith, for your entertainment and edification, and in no particular order, are some real weird offerings from our moving image collections. Now you'll, apropos to the theme, I've uh, offered some sensational headlines here to go with each clip. And by the way, we have 13 of them, so that's, I think, significant for the weird thing. Students subjected to radical experiments. Now this, real, this first thing is actually not a clip at all. It's a still photo, as you can see. Uh, it's of an evening class in civics at Park School here in Lincoln, March 1913. Um, and, and it shows, a significant thing about this is that it shows a very early use of moving images as a teaching tool. As you'll see right here in the middle, is um, a man operating a, a projector, hand crank projector. Uh, this projector is the Edison Home Kinetoscope. It was introduced uh, in 1912. Really, when you come to think about it, it was a forerunner of, of home video because it was a, uh, the first machine that was created to um, uh, allow people to watch moving images in the home or in this kind of venue. Uh, it used 22 millimeter films ordered directly from Edison's factory in New Jersey. No camera was ever produced for this. And actually it ended up being a commercial uh, disaster. Only about 2,000 of them were, were made and sold. Um, we believe this is the only one that the Lincoln Public Schools own. Um, 
This is 1913. The, uh, the uh, camera or the projector came out in 1912. Uh, now, also uh, here I have in front of me on the table that actual projector that's in the, that's in the, uh, the picture there. As you can see, it's, a, it's kind of a tiny thing, and it's a, it operates on hand crank system and so forth, carbon arc light, uh, pretty uh, sophisticated for the day. And we were very happy to, to get this recently from uh, Lincoln Public Schools and add it to our collections. Now, we jump ahead to the fall of 1959, the first use of television in a Lincoln classroom. Uh, this clip will show you and get it started here. Here we go. Um, a geometry class at Lincoln High School using television. And that year, over 1,700 Lincoln students were taught with television. So first we have the motion picture, 1913. And then we go to TV, and of course, you know, now you can't get them off a of TV. And the, the, TV, the TV goes off here, and the uh, teacher says, hey, get out your books. You remember books, you know? But I'm afraid by that time, they're already hooked. Secrets of Nebraska's Success Revealed. Now, the moving images were used to teach, as you saw in, the, in that last example, also to promote. There is a film made, uh, an early example of that from Nebraska history, is a film made in 1930 called Manpower, the story of industrial Nebraska. It's one of those films that shows uh, different industries and products and, and that sort of thing. And among that myriad of products and so forth, the Yukon waffle uh, was, was highlighted. Uh, neither a waffle nor from the Yukon, actually. <laughs> but uh, this, this was created by the uh, Loose Wiles Biscuit company, company in Omaha. And you'll see it here actually being manufactured. does make the mouth water, though. I, d I don't know if this, uh, anything like this is, is still made. It's sort of like a Klondike bar, I guess, but as you can say that, see, that personal touch goes into it. It's not totally automated. Now, one of the interesting things about this film is one little, little tiny part of it where it talks about um, what, it, what uh, it has to say about public education in Nebraska. <laughs> this, this is not edited. The, the, that title and this footage actually goes together side by side. Uh -huh. And I think, uh, I, think, I, I think there's a lesson here. I think, I think if there were more, more maypole dancing, in, in the public schools and universities nowadays, we, you know, we might be better off as a state. More people may, you know, stay in the state after graduation if we had more maypole dancing. That's, uh, you know, something I think we ought to uh, bring up to the legislature. If anyone's interested, let me know afterwards. Giant rodents and other creatures invade Lincoln. Now, uh, if you've seen the Weird Nebraska exhibit, you'll recognize the, the paper mache rat head here uh, on, the, on the side of the screen. Um, you know, it's interesting, after we put that exhibit up, um, we, uh, some, some moving image footed, footage came to us from the Lincoln uh, Parks and Recreation Department. And uh, I was watching it to, to evaluate it, and lo and behold, I saw, I saw what I think was a rat head. And, it, you know, I thought, my gosh, there's the rat head in this film we just got. Well, as it turns out, it's probably not this rat head, because this rat head was from 1936, 
It was used in the uh, pageant, the Lincoln Christmas pageant. It was back there, uh, back then they, did, they weren't afraid to use the word Christmas in any kind of public, uh, public uh, uh, program. Um, the films we got are from 1939 and 1940, but I'll show, them, show you some clips and I think you'll see what I mean about uh, the similarities here. These are the people getting, you know, pulling the stuff out. Obviously, they've, they've used this Mother Goose theme uh, over and over again, recycle it every year. <coughs> Giant legs. Weird, I mean, this, this, you know, if you actually witness this parade, you'd probably have nightmares for weeks. <laughs> so, as you'll see, the, the, some of the stuff is just really uh, visually disturbing. <laughs> the, uh, like this, I mean, it's like, that is just scary. And here... Okay, coming coming right up here is 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 a rat head, not the rat head. See, there you go. See the similarity there. Okay, now this is the actual parade. Now this these are clips from uh, a couple of different years. There are white mice there. Um, a couple of different uh, years of the parade, so there'll there'll be some some things. But I mean that. That, that would just really, really frighten me, this jack-in-the-box. I mean, that's, you know, I could see kids just screaming into the crowd. I don't know what the dinosaur really has to do with... Uh, with Mother Goose, but that being as it may, there's a penguin. Uh, of course, <laughs> penguins are very popular now. I guess they were then too. Flowers with heads, faces. This is interesting here because this uh, guy with, with a rat head or something, he, uh, there's a pig that comes down. <laughs> and this, this is probably the most elaborate of the floats. Here. Okay. Well, lest those mutant animals gave you the willies, take heart that one Nebraska town knew how to show who's boss. Holdridge, first annual Turkey Day, November 22nd, 1937. Now, the idea of Turkey Day was, well, you catch it, you eat it, basically. <laughs> and uh, here's, here it is. Um, they, they were tossing off rubs, um, live turkeys. <laughs> Some of the turkeys there. This, this is the uh, roof of the Daily Citizen newspaper. They threw 19 turkeys off of this roof and 56 more off of roofs of other locations. Uh, and you can see the people just, I mean, I hope they at least, you know, plucked them and cooked them before they <laughs> ate them. Uh, but here, the, the crowd goes wild. Uh, fortunately, no one was, uh, was uh, injured, except the turkeys, of course. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, after a while, the turkeys begin to evolve. They begin to learn. If you don't <laughs> land on the ground, you're probably safe. So they start going for the trees. You know, they're going for the buildings. They're, you know, they can't reach me here. Now this one here, they, the humans started to figure it out. They started to try to deflect the birds, get them back down there, and that one's a goner. Okay, well, happy Thanksgiving.
<laughs> about that. There is, uh, I got a newspaper article about that from the Hold Holdridge uh, Daily Citizen. Turkey Day draws large crowd. 75 birds were released from the roofs of four Holdridge buildings and the crowd madly scrambled to catch Old Man Gobbler on the hoof. It says here, no accidents occurred during the scramble for the turkeys, and catching the turkeys was not confined to men and boys. One little girl caught a gobbler larger than she was and was holding to him for dear life. All right, as I had, uh, if, if any of you were here for the last brown bag or uh, saw it on television, you know that I had promised some footage from the White Horse Ranch. And uh, you can learn more about the White Horse Ranch um, uh, here in our museum. We have a small exhibit up and so forth. Uh, it's in Naper, Nebraska. Earned some renown. Uh, it was a cover spread in Life Magazine at one point. And the subject of two Warner Brothers theatrical shorts, one in the mid-40s and another in the mid-50s. Here's the one from the mid-50s, Ride a White Horse. This is an excerpt from it. White horses make a beautiful sight as the roundup begins. This is the White Horse Ranch, way out in Nebraska. Look out for Junior there, he's got ideas of his own. The rest of the herd waits patiently. Wiser in worldly ways, these elder members of the White Horse family take more gently to the business of a pretty girl putting on a bridle, which might very well be called horse sense. This unusual ranch is the home of the famous American Albino, largest herd of pure white horses in this country. Of particular interest is the training and riding school here at the ranch. A bow to the students. Young ladies attend class on horseback and watch the dean of equestrian education, whose name quite naturally is Ruth White. She is at present giving a demonstration of the fine art of horse training. They listen carefully as Ruth explains that patience and kindness are requisites for training a horse of any color. These girls from all over the country are brought together by a mutual love for horses. Each will train her own mount. Thus, girl and horse go to school together. Play yard and classroom are practically synonymous here. The teeter-totter, a usual object for recess time relaxation, becomes an interesting lesson in four-footed intelligence and dexterity. There you are. Some of the more advanced students take a few practice jumps over the low hurdles. Later, on the spacious meadow beneath the blue Nebraska sky, Ruth paces the entire class through the perpetual circle of the rider round. As they walk and trot and canter, basic principles of horsemanship are pointed out to them. Um, I also had mentioned uh, last, last time that I was going to show some um, footage, uh, home movie footage of the White Horse Ranch. We just recently acquired uh, a lot of the old records and so forth of, of the White Horse Ranch, and among those records were a couple of uh, reels of home movies. So the cinematic quality, of course, is not as, uh, as refined as the clip you just saw, but uh, just it does show some uh, behind-the-scenes stuff that's kind of nice. This is from the late 1930s. This is the uh, Natural Amphitheater uh, uh, there on the ranch where they will hold shows. As you see, people just uh, sitting on the hillside. 
ready for the pageant. There's the teeter-totter that you just saw. This is uh, Ruth Thompson, again, uh, a spectacle uh, in her own right, and her stallion. And uh, the, the, the trick jumps, they would go um, first one, then two, one on each horse, then standing, then one person on two horses, one person on three, one on four, one on five. Looks like a scene from the uh, chariot race in uh, Ben Hur. And that's a lot of horses to jump. I mean, you know, you can't blame them for that. Now, uh, there were there was more to their pageants than than just horses. And uh, if you um, if you've just had lunch here, you may you may be about to lose it. Um, but they. Uh, they had these uh, trick skaters, and of course, not to be uh, left out, they invited uh, people from the, the crowd to come on, and, and uh, <laughs> little woozy getting off, off of the stand there. Okay. <laughs> Had about enough of that. <laughs> All right. Cattlemen caught in bizarre ritual. Now, from horses to cows, at least the men who broker them. This next clip is from a regional newsreel. Uh, follows Nebraska cattlemen who labor at the uh, Omaha Union Stockyards on a jaunt to Iowa to see a rodeo. They are happy to be out of the office. <coughs> There's the mule. Now this this is uh, they're all having a good time, and this is where things start to go horribly wrong. Now, not to be outdone, the, um, the town of Humboldt took the cross-dressing thing to extremes. And here we have some clips from the Humboldt Bargain Days, 1940. Now, I think the, the, the question of the day was, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> yeah, you know, the underwear on the outside. I mean, the, you know, long before Madonna ever came up with that. But th this was a, a fundraiser. They'd uh, drag no pun intended, <laughs> these, uh, these men slash women before uh, a panel of women. 
and find them and uh, raise, raise money for the community activities. <laughs> There's the, the, the dour uh, heads of the town for the day. Now this guy, this guy understands the slimming, you know, nature of <laughs> vertical stripes. Okay, Huskers win again, but this time it's not football, it's not even volleyball. This is a uh, universal newsreel of honest an honest-to-God corn husking bee. Uh, no ordinary corn husking bee either. This is the National Husking Championships of 1933, held in West Point, Nebraska. Seventy thousand gathered to watch watch the spectacle. Um, the winner and the runner-ups uh, runner-up were both uh, Nebraskans. And there they are. June snowstorm creates havoc. Now, a little backstory here. In 1924, the uh, Lions uh, Club International held its uh, convention in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the, the Lions are kind of a fun-loving bunch, and uh, you know they conduct business at this conference and so forth. But each state delegation is always looking to uh, you know, outdo the other in uh, hijinks and so forth. The Denver delegation brought a train car load of Colorado snow to Omaha in June and unleashed on unsuspecting attendees the snow during their parade. There's the, there's the snow. know what had started with you know at least a little decorum <laughs> just I mean e even the giant chicken is is not safe uh, it, ju it just uh, turns into a melee Okay, dead me mayor speaks from the grave. Now, not really from the grave, but just about as good. Here's the story. Um, in 1959, the city of Lincoln celebrated its centennial. And as part of that centennial, there, there were all kinds of, of different events that happened that year. Um, one thing that they did, though, was they uh, filled a time capsule, as you can see there, that cylinder, with uh, objects that and uh, documents and so forth that had to do with uh, Lincoln at the at the time in 1959 and uh, they 
put it into the ground in front of uh, Pershing Auditorium. And if you go there now, uh, as you're facing the auditorium over on the left, you'll see a plaque in the, in the ground, and that's, that's where this thing lies to this day. Now, the idea is that it would be dug up in 2059, so I'm giving you a bit of a, bit of a, a preview here. Uh, I probably won't be around in 2059, um, but um, we'll see what happens here. Now, this is, this is them filling up the, uh, the time capsule. The man in the middle there with the glasses is uh, Mayor Bennett Martin. This is before he became a library. <laughs> And it, as you can see, they've got newspapers, documents, books, various things like that that they're putting into this canister. And there it goes. They seal it up. They put it in the ground. Okay, then uh, that's, that's the, uh, the block that you'll see. But let's, let's back up here. Let's back up here, take, a, take another look at this thing. Okay, hold it right there. All right, now let's zoom in. Notice what's in the man's hand. This, a reel of motion picture film. The motion picture film has on it Mayor Bennett Martin addressing the mayor of Lincoln in 2059. And by some miracle, we, we have found a, a duplicate copy. I are disposed to marvel at the vast scientific and social changes which have occurred in the past 100 years. From the crude beginning, when a few pioneers eked out a livelihood with the meager tools and implements at their command, our present standard of living has reached the highest point thus far known to mankind. From our viewpoint, the inhabitants of this area 100 years ago undoubtedly suffered hardship and privation, but it is likely that they considered themselves to be enjoying a good life. Their problems exist only as we compare them with the progress of the intervening years. Today we believe that our mode of living is one of comfort and convenience, but I wonder how it will appear to you as you are permitted to compare it with the life you will have in 2059. Experts tell us that the greatest changes are yet to come. It has been a real thrill and privilege to serve our city of 130,000 population as their mayor during the past two years. I sincerely hope that you find in the office of mayor the same satisfaction in serving Lincoln that I have had. Now this film um, also brings up uh, an interesting story about what we in the audiovisual archives business call format obsolescence. There was a debate even at this time that uh, once they dug this film up in 2059, no one would possibly have the equipment anymore to play a 16 millimeter film with a magnetic soundtrack, uh, to which the, uh, the uh, uh, producer of the film, who was the news director at KOLN TV, Bob Taylor, said, well, I'm not gonna worry about it. <laughs> Ill-fated town disappears. Well, uh, it disappeared because it really was no longer needed. What we see here in some home movie footage from the, uh, the late 1930s, early 40s, is uh, what was dubbed Kingsleyville. It was a town that was set up uh, to house the workers that were, create, that were building Kingsley Dam and you know, the resulting uh, Lake McConaughey. Uh, it was set up in the 1930s, and of course after the, uh, 
the dam was built and so forth, the, the town disbanded. But they had, uh, uh, this here is a school, they had o over 500 residents, uh, spouses, children, and so forth. I focused here on the, uh, uh, the, the people, the look, the look of the place and, and the people uh, in it. Here's some of the uh, Army Corps uh, of Engineers people. Um, but the films also show an awful lot about the construction of the dam and so forth as very interesting home movies. out. <laughs> All right. You know, what would weirdness be without some strange flying objects? So uh, I had to throw these in here. This is a movie tone newsreel from uh, 1932, National Balloon Races, which started uh, in, uh, at the municipal airport in Omaha. Now, they didn't call them balloons. Actually, you know, it was a national balloon race, but when they refer to these objects, they call them bags. Uh, so this is actually a national bag race. <laughs> and there was, a, um, there was a city of Omaha bag. There was a junior chamber of commerce bag. There was an army bag and so forth. Uh, and you'll see here in a second some of some uh, on-camera interviews that were actually staged. What they did was they shot uh, uh, a uh, before scenario, and then if that if that team won, they also filmed a, a scenario of what they would say. And also listen to the there's a theme running. In, in these interviews about chickens. Bishop and I just had to win this race. He's got a little unfinished business in Switzerland, and I'm going along to chaperone him. See that he behaves himself. Don't worry about me. <laughs> to Don McCormick and myself attribute our success to the recent international balloon race by the use of this oxygen container. Using this container, we ascended to a height of 20,000 feet and thereby took advantage of high velocity winds of approximately 60 to 90 miles per hour. Well, Jack, I want to congratulate you on being my aide. And it was mighty fine that we had that fried chicken along so we could make it. Well, Trace, that chicken helped a lot, I know. But I still claim it was the pilot that won the race. Thanks. Certainly glad we uh, took that stuff along with us, old man. That chicken and the cake. If we hadn't had that, we would never won this race. Well, Ed, by gosh, I'll tell you, you get the credit. I hope that you are just as oh. happy of winning this race as you did the International in 27. Well, that's fine. We certainly had a good time out of it, anyhow. Well, I'm certainly glad to have been with you. Here's your chicken sandwiches and happy landing. Thanks, honey. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Well, goodbye and good luck. <laughs> and I'm not going to kiss you in public. <laughs> now, I guess the lesson there is that, you know, if you're going to go up in a bag, take chicken. <laughs> okay, this is, this is our last clip for today, number 13. This is the only one for which the sensational headline is really not a fabrication. Uh, this is a KOLN news interview with Ashland police officer Herb Shermer, who claims to have had a close encounter on December 6, 1967. 
And with him uh, in the interview, you'll see his boss, police chief, William uh, Wash Washen, I think it's pronounced. Officer Shermer, just exactly what did you see that morning? I've seen a UFO, unidentified flying object, which is like an object to me. Uh, I was going down Highway 6 about 2.30 in the morning, a.m., and uh, I had just got through checking the gas stations out on Highway 6 and a couple of the taverns uh, located there. I come down Highway 6 going toward Waverly, and there's a little spot where we turn around all the time. I turned around there. Well, when I was going down the hill, I glanced. I thought I saw a truck. It had big red lights on it. So I went down, these red lights weren't flashing. So I went down and turned around, and I glanced at my watch, and it was 2.30 a.m. Sunday morning, which was on the 3rd of December. I turned around, and I had put the car in low gear, and it was coming up to the Y, which Junction 63 was doing six. And when I seen this object, I flipped on my bright lights, and it sent out a, a bright aluminum flash, sort of a real bright, bright light. About how big was it? 20 feet wide, about 15 feet tall. All right, go ahead. And uh, the, uh, the uh, object, its red lights began blinking on and off, or I'd say more or less flashing on and off. And uh, it began moving around. It, it, was, uh, it never did touch the ground that I know of. It was only, it was about six to eight feet off the ground. It rose real slow up to about 50 feet. While it was moving up, it maneuvered itself around a little bit and then moved up and maneuvered itself around. Well, this object had a reddish orange beam which came out from beneath it. As this beam came out, it brought a sound out like a pulsating siren. Well, I mean, what I mean by pulsating siren, I, we have this uh, new fire truck that has one of these weird sirens on it. Sound something like that, but more weird than that. Was it loud? It was, yes, it was loud. It shot straight out of sight. Have you seen anything else like this before? No, sir, I haven't. I have never seen anything like this before in my life. When you got up to it, uh, how far were you from it? Approximately 40 to 50 feet away from it. Did it uh, make any? Uh, uh, sound of a, like a jet engine or anything like that other than the siren sound that you mentioned? No, it made kind of like a, a hiss sound when it shot straight up. What, what was its shape? It was shaped more or less like a disc or a football. I would say more like a football. And did it look like it was made of metal? Uh, I don't know if it's made of metal or not. It, it, it looked like it was made out of, it looked like polished aluminum, real bright. Have you asked for uh, the Highway Patrol to help you, or did you ask for the Highway Patrol to help no, you? Or no, you? no, I, uh, I called them right away, uh, State Patrol, and uh, on the sighting of the object, and uh, they advised me to uh, contact the military authorities at Offutt Air Base. What did Offutt say to you? Uh, no comment. Herb, what's been the reaction of the people around Ashland to what you said. How do they feel toward you? Have they changed their opinion of you or anything? Or they think you're some kind of a nut or something? Uh, nobody in town has made any cranks or what have you on this situation. Have you had anybody that wanted to ride along with you to help spot these things or to get a chance to see one of them? Oh, yes. I've had a lot of people want to ride with me when I'm on watch. They think we might see another one. Uh, poor Poor Herb was uh, never the same after that incident, and uh, I'm told that in his, uh, his report at the end of his shift, he wrote, 2.30 a.m., sighted UFO, intersections of highways 663, believe it or not. And it was this report that it, the chief saw the next morning, and uh, they, started, they started an investigation. Um, that, is, uh, that is all we have today for our weird, uh, real weird film clips. Uh, just re 
Remember that this is uh, this only scratches the surface, as does our our uh, exhibit, in terms of the strange and odd stories in Nebraska history. And just remember that history is a strange place. Thank you very much.